dates to remember for May are May 22nd, because we're going to clean up the historic village. Anybody can come right up there and see it that way. Uh, then July 7th, 14th, and the 21st, we're going to have Wednesday night at the museum. And we'll so I told you who's been uh, we crossed paths a few times collecting uh, various antique related items and uh, Mike has been an avid uh, bottle collector for how many years, Mike? Uh, okay. The nice thing about Mike, and I've never been able to have as much luck as Mike is that his wife is also interested and also collects with him. So they're a dual team and I, I, I take my hand off you. That's, that's very rare in today's collecting. Uh, but, uh, introduce Mike, and, I, uh, and Mike is a, a resident of Oslo, and uh, I forget how many bottles he told me he had at his house. He's got a few more bottles than I've got. We're an artifact, so that's a good thing. <laughs> so, anyway, I uh, thank you for coming, and thank you, Mike, for, for taking time on a busy schedule to uh, make a presentation. And, uh, thank you. Bob, uh, Mike Brown, and I hope you all can hear me. I was hoping not to use the microphone. Three hands, but um, this one did. I've been collecting bottles since I was pretty young. My uh, my father uh, started me collecting bottles by accident, and the fact that uh, he was at my grandmother's house and while working under the house repairing the furnace, he came home with these two early beer bottles about this time period here, and one was from Wyandotte, and one was from Detroit, a West Side Brewery. And I said, "Wow, those are pretty interesting." And they were always up there on the refrigerator. And we'd look at them. I have a twin brother. And we'd always look at them. Wow, those are pretty interesting. Pretty. One time my dad took us fishing. And of course, you know, the fish usually don't bite. But it was on uh, South River Road or North River Road? North River Road at the DNR Park there. And they had been dredging the Clinton River. And they had the spoils pile out there for dewatering, probably for years and years. And I'm sure it probably had lots of good contamination in it. But fish weren't biting, so we went, you know, poking around like kids do. We were about, you know, 12, 13 years old, and what do you know, right away we start finding bottles, and sure enough, I found a Champion Brewery from Detroit, and I was all excited, my brother found a Royal Tiger Bottling Works from Detroit, and it just took off from there, after that, we started looking for bottles anywhere and everywhere, as far as uh, looking at old uh, farm fields, old farm dumps, antique shows, antique shops, flea markets, anywhere and everywhere, right? Brad says, yes. anywhere and everywhere, bottles are out there. And of course, we were thinking back in the day, looking at that big dredge pile, thinking, wow, this all came out of the water. I wonder what's still in the water. So eventually, our goal was to start scuba diving. So in uh, 1988, I got certified as a diver. And a lot of bottles come from diving. Uh, a lot of them don't. A lot of these are, are purchased because you just can't find everything out there that you'd like to have in your collection. Um, and I asked Ken what he wanted as far as a uh, bottle uh, <coughs> topic. I decided well, I have a history of bottles because I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with uh, the older style of bottles. I'll go real quickly through the old stuff, how they're produced in different time periods. And I'll get to some local history bottles with some uh, local flavor in them. My primary area of collecting is local area bottles, although I keep the old stuff too because I appreciate it. Uh, I primarily collect bottles from Oakland County, Wayne County, Macomb, and St. Clair counties. And I probably have about, it's probably nearing about 5,000 bottles overall. So, this is Anybody wants to come over and help me dust? Volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> and it gets to the point after a while, I'm not even sure what I have anymore because I know when I was putting this together and I was looking for stuff, and I'd be looking for a bottle forever. I know it's here. I know I got it. I'd be finding stuff I didn't even know that I owned. I was like, where did this come from? I didn't even know I owned this. Or I'd be like, wow, that's nice. I got one upstairs I just bought last year. Oh, I got one here. <laughs> oh no, now I got to sell one. <clears throat> So, well, bottles have quite a history. Uh, you know, man has always needed something to transport uh, fluids, liquids in. You know, early on, they were using animal skins. Uh, but at some time period, they finally decided, you know, they discovered glass. But, you know, pottery goes back 18,000 years. There's history that man was even using ostrich shells, you know, 60,000 years ago. Glass comes into use early in the period and the fact that you know early man found out that they had volcanic glass and it became wonderful for using you know making arrowheads they could make some wonderful tools and cutting edges out of the city in their volcanic glass um, first uses of glass they were making beads for decorative purposes because they really didn't know about putting them into a, uh, into a bottle so blowing the glass 
first bottles were actually a person rolling beads, hot glass, they're not doing it by hand, I'm just going to show you because they would burn like you know what. But they would roll out that and they would cut the glass beads, you see that in early uh, Egyptian stuff. I'm sure one day someone said, hey, you know what, we make pottery where we take the coil and we wrap it around and we bake it. What happens if we make glass real hot and make it into a coil? So your first glass bottles, uh, you know, 100, 200 BC are glass core or sand core, they call it, where they put the glass around and they heat it and then you get a, a coiled bottle. But your first bottles are... Uh, Going to be, uh, I just want to let you know what a glass is. It has three basic components there's uh, sand, soda, <coughs> lime, and most people think of bottles as being extremely stable. Well, sand is silica is pretty solid, but when you want to put it together using a soda, you flux it and melt it together. But actually, sand is kind of water soluble over time, it does, you know, doesn't stay the way you want it. So they put lime in there as a stabilizer. And different mixtures of glass over time are more stable than others, and depending on what environment you put them in as far as being corrosive, they actually start, you know, breaking down. The surface of the bottle actually starts disintegrating. And I've got some early ones from the 1700s that I didn't bring, where they're pretty bad looking. You see ones that they come up from shipwrecks where salt water is extremely corrosive on bottles, and the bottle is almost like a skeleton if it's in a real bad, exposed to salt water. Area with a lot of different minerals in the sand. So, uh, glass blowing. The first uh, concept of glass blowing starts in 50 BC. They're not exactly sure, but evidence is found along the Syria Palestine coast there. I'm not sure how one day someone said, Hey, boy, I wonder if I put this thing and blow air into it while it's hot. And that, everything just took off from there. Uh, that's what the early stuff looks like. That's a very unusual one, but it's usually pretty crude stuff. Uh, and they were, it was kind of expensive to make glass. So it's mostly little stuff, expensive liquids, perfumes, exotic oils. Most of your big items are still going in uh, pottery and you know, gourds and regular stuff like that. A lot of pottery. <laughs> but we get to the early American stuff. Uh, early American stuff primarily came from Europe you know, prior to the Revolutionary War. One of the, there was attempts at early glass because one of the first things when they sent the people over here at Jamestown in 1607 was to set up a glass house. Uh, of course it failed, of course, along with pretty much everything there. But they did set up a glass house, but in the early 1730s, 1760s, there were uh, glass houses in New York and Pennsylvania. And by 1770, Everything pretty much develops fully. You get a whole lot of glass houses in New York. Pennsylvania was heavy in glass houses. They're primarily utilitarian. You know, there's not a whole lot of uh, decorative and fancy stuff early on. It's just made to handle liquid. And of course, they're pretty expensive. So early on, a lot of people that had bottles made, they had glass seals put on them. They would have their name right on the bottle. They kind of expected that bottle to come back. They had pride in it. So a lot of them actually have specific dates right on it from the 1700s and late 1600s. Those you can definitely attribute to the U.S. because they've got it, you know, it's made in a, in a U.S. glass house. The early stuff, uh, like this uh, shaft and globe here is uh, 1500s. It's, uh, I should get to that later though. It'll be in the next slide. But I'm going to show you the shaft and globe because I know in the next slide it's not there. But this is an early shaft and globe. They started that style in actually the 1300s and lasted right up to the you know, early 1600s. The style didn't change much. There were definitely a lot of, I don't want to make you think all glass was real simple. You know, the people that had money, uh, royalty, there's some very exotic pieces of glass early on. I'm going to jump across here real quick. And if you ever, guys ever get up into the New York area and you get into the Corning Glass Museum, they have some excellent glass. Because this is, you know, Roman time period, they actually cut glass layers. So, you know, the technology was there if you had the money, they could do it. But most of your early stuff, Roman stuff was nice, simple bases, containers, perfumes. Um, there was an early glass house in Michigan. I just want to mention that. You guys may not may already know that, but in Mount Clemens in 1835, there was a glass house that lasted to about 1848. Um, the primary uh, item that came out of there was uh, dinnerware, uh, dishes, bowls, drinking glasses. Uh, not a lot of evidence of uh, bottles that I've seen. Of course, I'm not an expert on that area, but there's you know, 
1988 uh, Michigan History Magazine. It was an excellent article in early on Mount Clemens Glass House. Jump back across here to my controller. Sorry, my uh, remote couldn't, uh, couldn't get it to work, so I got to work with the mouse here instead. Okay, so the early ones are hand blown. They're blown by mouth by either being free blown or they're blown into a mold. And the first thing we're going to cover is the, the free blown and some basics on it. They utilize a, a blow pipe. And a blow pipe is usually four to six feet long. It takes some skill to use it and learn how to blow glasses. There was a, a highly skilled trade, and actually a lot of the early uh, glass houses highly protected their glass blowers. They didn't want them going to other glass houses, and even they didn't want glass blowers coming over from Europe. I mean, that's why a lot of early stuff was pretty much over there, but cheap resources were here, so eventually they you know, put the trade over here. What was it made out of? Uh, the blowpipe? Yes. It's uh, steel or iron. And there's different shapes with different ends, all depending on what you're trying to do. This here is usually a wood handle or a wrap rope or cord, because you know, that pipe will get hot, so you're looking to protect your hands there a little bit. So the glass blower then blows into the pipe, there's a guy blowing, and he gets that little first piece glowing after getting it out of the furnace. And this is when it first forms, it's called the parasite. And right away when they take that and they get that thing going, a big glob of glass, depending on what they're trying to make, they're going to shape it with your little handles here, different shapes, different pieces over different times, these give you different sizes depending on what you're trying to do to make these early shapes on those bottles. Or they could use wood paddles. Or they could actually use uh, uh, tongs, and the tongs being a, uh, believe it or not, they just call it a tool. If you're a glass maker, I don't know if you call it the tool. There's proper terms, they call it a pusilla. But it's a uh, pair of metal tongs. They adjust it to shape the different sides of the bottle, shape the neck and the top and all that stuff. And put different uh, twists and turns in it. There's an early one piece here. This actually came out of a state <coughs> sale in, on Harsons Island. And this is done in an early process. This is all hand done with the uh, really metal tools. So are these, this is uh, 1500s actually. This is uh, from uh, Persia. There's actually quite a bit of these that come out, so it's not all that rare, but these early uh, perfume bottles, but they're from that time period. It's all hand done. Can you find them in the water? Or? Some of these are uh, found diving. Some are found by other divers. Um, a lot of them are, are purchased because I couldn't get everywhere to get everything that I would like. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, so like I said, the free bowl mile is used by shaping using uh, blocks and paddles. They're usually irregular in shape. They're prior to 1800 because the, the next step is going to be getting molds to get a consistency in size and shape to get the regular volumes because people don't want to be cheated. And of course, you don't want to be selling too much of your product in too large of a container. So, there's again a little picture of a wood uh, uh, the paddle in, in use. And they're made out of wood. They're also made out of, if you see modern day glass blowers, some of them are made out of graphite. Uh, one of the preferred material for graphite's not going to burn. The free blow bottles, like I said, are regular in shape. So you never know, this one here will hold a certain volume, this one will hold a certain volume, and they'll be all different. You can all make them in a row, and they'll all be different. Uh, so the next step is to uh, get the blow, to get the hand-blown bottles that are shaped using molds. And this starts about 1820, and they decide, hey, we can get a consistent shape if we blow into a mold. And it could be as simple as the early ones are just wood molds that are round or square to get your desired shape and volume. Because you can pretty much know the size of glass you're going to pick up now to try and control the puff of air that you're going to put in there to get the desired volume is tough. Come to achieve uniformity. Your early ones are your dip molds. This is a round one. There's your two hinge. There's another picture of one. Different ones where it closes on a base, one where it has a line across the base, your three piece. And I just want to jump over here and show you some of these early ones. So these are, you know, all early free blow. This is a, you know, 17, this is actually 1680 to 1700. This is a Dutch. This is also Dutch, same time period. And as you can see, they're starting to come to the normal shape of the bottle. The early ones, like they said, the shaft and globe is a round globe with just a shaft on it. But eventually, 
This has got an English one here. So, this one actually could be American. I'm not sure. It came out of uh, the history that came out of the provenance that came with it. It came out of auction in Virginia. So whether it originated from Virginia, it's hard to say. These are Dutch here, I know, because I know the guy that obtained them. Uh, he was a, he is a U.S. soldier. He's probably retired by now, but he was doing uh, some duties in northern South America there. So this is in the, the Dutch Guyanas, where the, actually the diamond miners are mining and sucking all the sand out of the river to get the diamonds. And of course, they're sucking on bottles. So they're also selling them, too. Eventually, they start putting more of a shape on the bottle. This one's called a mallet. This is 1725, 1760 time period. Right away, they start, uh, uh, these are also, you can see they start getting more of a bottle. These are all totally free-blown, shaped using the wood paddles, no molds yet. Your standard wine-shaped bottle, using all free-blown again, no, no molds. These are the first ones. These ones here, when I look at them, I don't see the actual telltale mark of them being blown in mold. These are probably done with a wood paddle, all sides, paddling it down. What type are those? This is a case gin, and they call it a hog nose case gin for, for a reason. Okay. And eventually they're going to start blowing them into uh, dip molds. And you can see these here where they just blow it into a shape. It's just a little bit of compression. And it forms, they can be really complex. I think it would be just simple cylinder. This one here is just blown into a simple mold. And these here are blown into a, a simple a square mold or a, a tapered rectangular mold. Um, children working the lower end, a lot of young boys working you know, on blue hours and early on doing that. There's a gentleman here, he's preparing this pound of rod with the next glob of glass. This guy is blowing this into a, a mold. He's got a series of two molds here if you wake up. This kid here has got actually a, a tongs or a fuselage in his hand. He's not going to be forming the bottle, it's just to grab the bottle so he can put it off to the side. For this guy, which will be the next step, which I'll be talking about in a second here. A little video clip here, for, uh, courtesy of the Bureau of Land Management website. If you guys ever get out to that, you can see guys making models here. If you notice, when he blows that, he blows that real thin at the top. And I can imagine these guys without safety glasses. I don't care if we're blowing glass in science class or anything. You blow that real thin, and it hits that cold temperature. You put that nice puff of air in there and there's just a raining of fine glass everywhere. So this guy must have went home with some real irritated eyes at the end of the day. <coughs> so this is the early mold, like I said, the dip mold, the round and the square, and then it can, it can be more complex, they can be multiple sizes, just to get the uniform size. But they can get more complex right away. As soon as you get the mold in there, you can get anything from uh, this Indian Queen, there's ones that are shaped like cabins, which I didn't put any in the production in the presentation here. But right away, as soon as you start using molds, you can start putting lettering on there for advertising instead of using the glass seal that's melted right on the bottle. I do have one glass seal bottle here that's from uh, Holland, and it's uh, not that rare one to come across actually. So I was able to get it. Uh, stuff with glass seals on it is extremely expensive with dates, and especially if you can establish the provenance of the guy's initials or the last names, they can get really uh, expensive. Now the next part, important part of the bottle production, once you made the bottle, is to make the top. And the top of the bottle is called the finish. This is not actually the end of the presentation. It's called the finish. It's the formation of the lip of the bottle. It's achieved through impotling the bottle or by a snap case. 
and pottling means grabbing the bottom of the bottle and attaching it back to a metal rod of some sort so you can now work on the top. Here's the official definition of pottling, or empottling. So you attach it back to the punty rod to form a desired lip. And this is pretty much pre-Civil War time period because right before the Civil War is when they're going to come up with uh, what they call a snap case or a, uh, it's lost a sabot is what it is, the French term for it. There's various types of pontals, how you want to reattach it, and how you attach that thing to the bottle is going to determine how easy it is to unattach it, too. Uh, so you can imagine why they wanted to get rid of pontling, because it did, once you got the bottle blown nicely, now you're going to reattach it, you're creating a whole lot of much of hazard trying to break it off once you're now finished putting your lip down. Now they can either take and put it right on the same glass blow rod, right, that you broke it off from the top of the bottle, and you get a remnant of the bottle on the bottom, that's called an open pontle. You can attach it right to a bare iron rod and you get your iron pile. Sometimes it's called a graphite pile because this iron can be red, it can turn black, it can oxidize differently. Or there's a different pile here called a sand pile. And that's where they take a piece of iron that's really hot and they dip it into some little fragments of glass or sand or raw silica, stick it right on the bottle so you get just enough to stick but it's easy to break right off. And it leaves little pieces on the bottom. Sometimes it can, these can be very hard to detect on the bottom. This here's an example of an open pommel bottle. You can see there's quite a few open pommels around here. Uh, this is an open pommel. Picked up at an Ohio garage sale for 25 cents. I can't believe it. I can't believe the bottle that old there from the dip mold from that. This is another one. This one was actually dug in Ann Arbor. It's an open pommel. This one's also a larger open pommel. And it, the limitations of the open panel, you have to imagine, is the thickness of your glass and whether you stick it on or whether it's just going to fall off and hit the floor and wreck all your work that you put in it. This is an open panel, came out of uh, Battle Creek area. This is an open panel that came out of an antique shop in Port Huron. No, no story on it, the lady couldn't tell me anything other than she got it somewhere and she can't remember. This is an iron panel. Iron panels went right up into the 1850s. This is a Detroit bottle with an iron panel on it. Uh, the problem with uh, iron panels is they don't necessarily all stay there. The iron that's transferred there will wash away if it's put in the right environment. Because I have, didn't bring them with me, but bottles that are found scuba diving, when you find it, the iron panel is nice and red. But you can rub it, and it'll all come right off. But you'll still have the scar of rough glass to know that it's an iron panel bottle. So most of these are uh, uh, sand panels or open panels. This actually this is an open panel. You'll find a sand panel here eventually. These are sand panels for sure. This is the time period where they just did a little bit of sand on there to hold it with your uh, iron uh, end of it. It'd be like a glob. Just stick it on there and, and make do with it. Same thing with that one. Oh, well, yeah, this is a trick of, of bottling. You know, once you think you maybe blew the bottle too big, we can push that bottom way up in there. And you know, it carries over nowadays. You see wine bottles, and they kick them, and people say, Why has it got that in there? Well, that's a big part of the blowing process, if you can reduce the volume of the bottle. Of course, they're pulling all kinds of tricks on us nowadays with every product we're getting. They're tapering edges and kicking them up deeper, and butter and yogurt. And don't even get me started on that. They're cheating here which way they can, changing the shape of that bottle or the jar or everything they can do for you. They're out, they're always out there to help you. Spend your money on them. So the, fruit, the lip is used, uh, formed using a range of tools. Uh, early on, uh, it'd be used using that, like I said, the pusillor or the tongs. And the tongs can have pieces on it so it's not using just pure steel so that you can actually use, uh, uh, they would actually use pieces of wood or graphite in the tongs so you can help shape it. And then they crack it off. But, Early on, someone said, hey, wouldn't this be a great idea if I could just make a tool that could form it all at once? So early on, let's say, probably about the, this is about eight, the Civil War time period, they started forming lips with one pair of tongs. You just insert it, you get your inside of your, your bottle all done, you get your outside, and here's your outside of your laptop, top, and you're done. This is a, one, actually, a friend of mine, this is missing one section of the wood handle here, because this thing will get hot, so you want to. A friend of mine found this at an antique shop in Ohio and a bunch of antique tools. The guy didn't have any idea what it was at all. I said, I don't know what it's for. And of course, a friend of mine knew exactly what it was for. So it's 
Now you can pay for it. You got a guy here with some kind of strange tool, you just didn't know what it did. Now the stamp case is the next step. Now instead of sticking back on, heating up the bottle and sticking glass on it, wouldn't it be great if you could just grab the bottle and hold it and work it the other way without having to melt it back on? And that's what they did. Back in this picture, you can see here the gentleman standing here waiting for this bottle. So this guy here can probably slap the glass on it. He's not ready to blow the next bottle. He might have a little bit of glass that he's going to put on there, melt onto the top. And this guy may actually may be working it with the tool. After this, I'm going to jump real fast here into the automatic bottle machine. About 1905, everything changes. Increased production, about 1905 to 1910, everything changes, everything goes as far as hand-blown, hand-made, everything disappears. And they're going to go to the automatic bottle machine. Instead of forming the bottle and then forming the lip, they're going to form the lip first and then form the bottle. So they're going to grab a known amount of glass that's going to have the shape of the lip, slice it off, and then turn around and blow it into the mold. The lip will be formed first. So a lot of bottles that you see from 1905 to about 1930 will have a very prominent, what they call an Owen's ring scar. And that's basically just the glob of glass where they shoot it off and they blew it into the mold to form it. And these are two exact models, same manufacturer, just made a few, few years ago. <coughs> Okay, so now we get to the local bottles. Any questions on the older stuff? Okay, like I said, they can make all kinds of exotic shapes. You know, once they got to the molds, they started getting into the cathedral pickles. They got really exotic with this and cathedral pepper sauces. These come this big with all kinds of multiple windows and everything. And like I showed you, the flasks are quite ornate when they started getting into as far as they were able to make. This is a scroll flask. What was that? Is that an expensive bottle? Uh, scroll flasks vary in value from about $60 to thousands of dollars. All depending on the scrolls, the middle scrolls, what's in here, whether there's a glass maker inside the center portion, uh, color. Color makes a big deal. And aqua is your most common color. Aqua. I didn't mention the colors of glass, but most of your uh, aqua glass is just due to the iron impurities in your sand that you get. Now, they'll add more iron to get darker greens. Eventually, they'll, the goal will be to start clarifying the bottles and make the glass clear. And you can make that by adding lead. You can make different colors by adding different uh, oxides and cobalt to make blue. Um, reds are done with copper and gold. What other colors are there? Let me think right here. One of the clearing agents that they use. How about a bottle shaped like a violin like that? The violins? Those were also made the same time period. A little darker blue. And they were they were made for uh, internal home use. You could buy these. I mean, everybody bought these that was going to bottle something. You could buy a, this type of bottle, or you can buy a pretty bottle. These bottles come when I've seen some that actually have labels on them for liquor. Vinegar, original ones that still have them. Um, if you ever get out to uh, St. Louis area and you're able to check out that uh, steamship that they uh, had, a side wheel uh, steamer that they uh, excavated over there in the Mississippi River out of the farm field, they've got a wealth of bottles in there. Original ones that were shipped that were never used, you know, empty ones that were meant for that. Plus, they got plenty of these that are all filled with the product still, with the corks, because they were in the mud where they were preserved. What kind of products were those? Uh, pickles, capers, olives, fruits. I'm told about the olives. Olives. Oh, olives. <laughs> he found hundred-year-old olives in Marine City, and he opened them up and ate them right after we were done dying. No, I, I found a bottle, and it was. It came up. It had a big wood cork on it, a big wide mouth on it. it still had the foil on the top, but the pressure change after being underwater, the cork blew up. So the olives are there. They're firm and solid. Well, you know, olives will last forever. Olive oil, and so I'm like, well, they're solid still. They smell good, so I, I ate them, and they were good. The, the pits were—it was just like eating right at you know, Savaggio. My wife's like, you better stop eating this, because I'll be taking you to the hospital. Yes, sir. Is there a difference in the value of a bottle if it still has the contents or if it's empty? Yes and no. Uh, some people like them empty, so they're easier to display, so you can see them. The problem with 
having the original contents in the bottle is it can become unstable, pressurized, it can crack your bottle. It can, uh, you have to make sure your cork is going to stay sealed, so you have to figure a way to preserve your cork, especially if it's been found out in the environment. If not, if, you know, corks will, will disappear after time and just fall in, because this bottle over here, which I'll be talking about in a minute, was found fully corked with contents, with medicine in it. And I tried to preserve that cork. It just was not how it was wax sealing it and everything. And you could just smell the stuff when it was in the cabinet. It was definitely, you know, definitely a snake oil there for making making you better. Actually, it was supposed to cure cholera. <laughs> but, so there's, I still think there's the residue is still in the bottom. It finally all dried up. But I figured, well, I'm going to clean it out and get it back. Well, actually, I can't find anything that will actually dissolve that stuff now, now that it's all dried out. So, you were supposed to drink that. Again, that didn't answer my question. Oh, are they more? I have, a, I have a 1940 case of Stroh's beer that was found in, in the crawl space. And evidently the workman never had a time to uh, get to enjoy it. And it's yeah. still full. That probably would be okay in, in that time period. It's going to be a, a metal cap with a cork insert. So as long as that cork stays moist, it should be fine, but you have to watch where you store those because now the, if the caps start picking up humidity, they start rusting, they'll lose their integrity, and then you'll have uh, stinky beer or you know, that still will ferment. Uh, Check the bottle, make sure there's no moist in them. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a different thing. came that way. <laughs> but uh, I have found beer bottles diving that are still fully uh, sealed with, with beer in them. They have this type of closure on them because this closure was extremely durable. Uh, a lot of different parts of these will actually break down, but this actually is called the Baltimore Loop. And it actually, the first they had, one they made was a hard rubber stopper that slipped in there. And you pull it out like a bathtub plunger. But that became a little bit expensive to make. So what they did was they made like a little aluminum dish that slipped right in and had a little rubber ring around it. These bottles will last forever, you know, if you have beer in them, they're not going to fail. So. If a bottle has a glass top, um, you know, it, it looks to the eye like it's got a little medicine, and then the glass top would come off, and that would almost be like your dosage. Yeah, um, dose cup on, on top, yes. Yeah. Um, a couple companies did make a, a, a dose cup that actually sealed on top of the bottle, and you, you pick it up and then you pour it into it. Actually, the one if you're thinking about, you know about, about the Wyeth bottle? This one is very interesting because it actually had a very complicated patent process where the dosage was on the side of the bottle on the paper label, but there was a series of numbers that you'd rotate it to match when your next dose would be at. You'd keep rotating it. Of course, it's in dark blue glass and trying to read those little numbers. Like if you're doing it at night, you'd be out of luck. The next one at 12 or 11. <laughs> It didn't show up very well, but that's the one company I know that did that with the interesting uh, dose cups on their, right on their bottle. And it acted, acted as the closure, too. So, uh, early bottles were brought people here, you know, migrating from the east. Early on, you know, French explorers and missionaries bought the early bottles here. You know, you got the earliest, you know, French settlements here. You got the Moravians, and they definitely would have had some type of bottle material here. Uh, people going up to the UP, you know, the early missions up there. Then you get the fur traders coming through with all their supplies, same time period, primarily. Uh, then there's come the farmers and the pioneers, bringing anything and everything. And they brought bottles, and of course bottles came after them, you know, the, where the product, people went, the products went, you know, the sales, people went to sell them anything and everything they could. And all those products came in bottles. Early days they would use those bottles until they were broken. But there's a certain time period where bottles became more common. And they're not going to save them until they're used up. They're going to pitch them off wherever, discard them in some way, shape, or form. And that's usually the way I hope I find them. But I've done work at archaeological sites, quite a few now, where we're just you know, screening out pieces and you're identifying pieces of bottles. Loggers and miners were very good for uh, bottles. A lot of mining up there in the UP. Maybe here from the Nibble family, which is one of the early uh, breweries up in uh, Eagle Harbor, up in the UP. And industrialization brought all kinds of bottles, a whole wealth of products that came in. One of the early bottles I want to talk about here, it's probably one of the first embossed bottles from Michigan, although there's a few contenders that have 
uh, it's hard to say because uh, this person, John G. Owen, not to be considered uh, confused with the other John Owen out of Detroit, who was a big grocer and uh, banker and everything. John G. Owen comes from, uh, uh, well, he comes from England, but he relocates in Armada in 1843. And he comes to Detroit where he starts his uh, working in a drugstore about 1844. And somewhere in that time period, 1846, they got him moving out to Clarkston and opening up his own grocery store. So he's working as a clerk, but somewhere in this time period, there's Dr. Owen's European Life Business. And this was one of his medicines. Now, why this one's in Boston, Detroit, he also made a bottle like this, a little smaller, than <coughs> uh, Dr. Owen's uh, horse linen. And they're, they're found out there. They're, I'm assuming they're 1840s time period because it's Mark Detroit. But he goes to Clarkston in 1846. Now there's a later bottle that are actually Mark Clarkston also, Dr. Owen's European Life Bitters, and also Horse Liniment. They come in various sizes, and those are also open bottle. But they're a whole different style of bottle. They're the ones with the sunken panels like this, in the later time period. They're all pretty tough to find. Uh, as far as what he did after that, Owen is he got big into lumber. He went into Saginaw, he did a bunch of, uh, ran a big grocery store over there. And actually, the town of Owen, Dale, Michigan is actually named after uh, John Owen. So, up there in the town. He probably passed through it real fast. Like. <laughs> the girl I work with is, lives out of Saginaw, Owen, Dale. She goes, there's, there's no much anything there. <laughs> Don't you know the history of your town? She's like, there's a history? I know nothing about it. Okay, now to get more local here, the next bottle, I'm dealing with the medicines first. This is one that's definitely uh, a local guy here, James Lockwood uh, Conger, who came early here to, in the 1830s and formed the, uh, founded the town of Belvedere, 1836-1837 time period. You guys probably know quite a bit about uh, Conger, mm -hmm. some of you know, some of you know quite a bit about uh, Mr. Conger. Uh, he started the town of Belvedere and all kinds of great hopes for stores and hotels. And some of that was actually built. There was actually a steamboat landing, because I've actually been, there's a marina there now, and I've actually been there. And I asked the guy whether they dig anything up. And Where's the that? On the Clint River. At the very end of the river? No, no, no. Actually, it's a little bit in. Um, and he says, no, they don't dig any bottles. But he actually dug some bottles up in, on his property on Harsons Island. So that led me to taking a look at bottles that he had and he dug on his property on Harsons Island. But he didn't have any uh, conger bottles, because there's an early one out there. And this is the one that Mr. Carl Mark Paul, right? The guy with three first names is looking for. It. There's two of these known right now. Now, somewhere in this time period, there were a couple cholera outbreaks, 1840, 1849. And about 1849, listed in the Detroit newspaper, there's an ad for Dr. Conger's magic regulator, and he also has his uh, liver pills. This is a very early one. It's uh, marked Conger's. It's marked Belvedere, Michigan. Both of the ones that are known have original paper labels on them. They're both open panel. This one has a little crack in it. I can't quite find it, but the guy always tells me it's cracked, and he cries about it because he said he's going to put the crack in it. This is a very early, delicate bottle. You can see actually Conger actually signs his name here. And price one dollar for this little bottle. So you can imagine 1849, a dollar for a bottle. That was a lot of, a lot of money. You sure were hoping that that was going to cure your, as it says, uh, <coughs> here it says cholera, but in the ads it says Asiatic cholera. So <laughs> different kinds of cholera. This is some of his later ads. This is 1851 time period. Um, and he has Asiatic cholera. It's being sold in, uh, this is actually from the Port Huron commercial newspaper. And as we know, Conger was also uh, into politics. So actually he went to Washington, served in the U.S. House of Representatives from Michigan in uh, 1850, 1852 time period. Um, and I quite understand from reading from what I recall, one of his main things he always wanted to do was get that sandbar out of the front of the Clinton River so that boats can get going up the Clinton River so you know, and get some boat traffic going up there and get some uh, businesses going. Uh, this uh, second ad here is 1853-1854 time period. So he's out of office now. But conveniently, he has this, all these, the first one is just an ad for it. The second one, he's actually getting people that are actually stating that his medicine is good. So you actually got Mr. Felch out of Detroit, if you guys are familiar with some early Detroit history. 
But he also, over here, gets all his buddies out of Congress to, to vouch for his medicine. So he's actually got Mr. Fuller, representative from Pennsylvania, Mr. Ward from Kentucky, Mr. Penniman from the first uh, district out of Michigan, back from Caldwell out of North Carolina, Murphy out of Georgia. And then he actually gets the chief clerk of the House of Representatives to document that all these people vouch for his medicine. I don't know if this would apply nowadays, but. So he's selling a snake oil medicine as Congress managing regulator in tonic liver pills. With his buddies from Congress vouching for him. Well, Congress uh, medicine uh, eventually, there's not a lot of the bottles. For the time, for the amount of ads that you see out there, you don't see a lot of those bottles. From Belvedere, you don't see, because eventually, again, you understand he lives in Mount Clemens. You don't see any Mark Mount Clemens. But in 1866, uh, there's a, an ad that appears that now Congress Magic Regulator is now going to be made in St. Clair. He's passed on the business to a man named E.D. Kitten, who's also the druggist and the postmaster at that time in St. Clair. And this bottle is uh, Congress Magic Regulator, St. Clair, Michigan. E.D. Kitten was going to make that medicine there for a little bit. Uh, these bottles are quite tough to find. I, I've got one here. Like I said, it was found corked with contents. Um, you find these in St. Clair diving off the boardwalk. And I say you find them because I find I got about 30 or 40, but they're all broken. This is the only whole one I got. The very first year diving, like on my second dive, I found one corked with contents. But I've got a whole tray full of broken ones, all different stages, the tops knocked off, front panels, back panels only, bottoms chipped out. It's almost like they went out there and just pitched them all out, <laughs> got rid of them, and maybe stuff wasn't working. But if that were the case, you know, the medicine wouldn't survive because it actually goes on to last longer. This is an ad from uh, uh, St. Clair uh, Republican, 1866. Uh, this accompanies the ad that says, you know, that uh, E.D. Kitten here is going to be making the medicine. And he's making the magic regulator and the liver pills now, 1866. Yeah. What do you think were the uh, ingredients? You know, he doesn't say, but on, on the, in his ad he says, write for the little pamphlet, or make sure to take a look at the little pamphlet to talk about the contents and, the, and that's that kind of information. Most everything, most of those early medicines, they made you feel better because it had a lot of alcohol in it or it had some other type of opiate in it. So maybe you weren't getting better, you were just feeling better. <laughs> and probably getting hooked on something. Uh, this is a, another early... Uh, <coughs> Conger dies in 1876. Uh, and in his ad, you know, if his medicine wasn't successful, it talks about a lot of the things he did. It mentions that he was in the Congress. But it specifically mentions, and he brought us magic Congress, or Congress magic regulator. Wow, so it must have been, you know, of some success. This is an example of a later piece, because uh, actually this, this stuff goes on um, to be sold later on. A company in Detroit picks it up. This is a William Shealy and Brooks. They're selling Congress Mandrake liver pills. And I know that there's another bottle that another collector has that actually says Coran Williams and Clark, Congress Magic Regulator and Embossed Medicine. But I wasn't able to get over to his house and get a picture of this presentation. But I picked up this little tiny, tiny little case here. It's tiny, it's made out of balsa wood. And it's actually got a, uh, an invoice in it that's used to, probably wasn't held to hold the liver pills, you know, it was used for something afterwards, maybe to hold someone's ring or something. But it's got an invoice from 1893 and it's from Saginaw, that's all crumpled up in there, a hole, whatever went in there. But this company in Detroit was only in business as William Sheely and Brooks for one year. It's a big company. This is just one year that they reorganized into this, and then next year they brought on different partners, and everything changed. Um, the medicine does go on to be produced. I got a catalog from 1909 for Coran, Williams, and Clark, and they're still advertising. Now, this is after the Food and Drug Act, which you're supposed to take out the word cure and anything that's metaphysical and the concept of magic. So actually, it's just advertised as Congress regulator in, in 1909. So in 1909, they're still making Congress regulator. I haven't seen one, but they were still making it. And it was available <coughs> by four, gosh, I had it written down, but I don't have it here. I think it was $7.50 a, a dozen you can buy it at the time. Into some uh, drug stores, 
there's right about 1895, the explosion of embossing on pharmacies just goes crazy. Prior to that time period, they were pretty much unembossed cylinders or rectangles. But early on, about 18, 1880s, 85, 80, or something even from the 1870s. But most of your early stuff is going to be patent medicines, where you're having a specific product. But at a certain time, 1880s, 1880s, the nice ones I've seen. Every drugstore suddenly has their own bottles, which is great for people that are interested in collecting, because now then the collection you can <coughs> and it'll continue right up into the 1920s, almost early 30s. This is a owl drugstore out of Mount Clemens, a big owl laundry. You notice that this is a 32 ounce bottle, which is mm. extremely large for pharmacies, because most of them are three, four, five, six, seven ounce. And they're always in Roman numerals with the old symbol here for ounce which it looks like a three superimposed on another three. This is another little tiny owl drugstore, Mount Clemens. Now this bottle is real tiny. It actually fits into the shape of this owl. It's not a very big bottle. It's down here. This is a, a big monster with the owl on it. This one's all cracked up. It's been glued back together. I've never seen another one, so I figured I'd better hold on to it for historic purposes. And then there's the little one. The little one actually came out of the dump in Calumet, Michigan. Big monstrous dump over there. We went digging and digging to go find things to see what we could find for the UP. And when I go up there and dig and dig and I dig a Stroh's beer bottle, a blob top like this. And I dig a pharmacy from uh, Mount Clemens. I dug some other stuff, but those are the two things that definitely stick in my mind that I dug that day. The Owl Drugstore uh, was located on uh, Cass Avenue. It's uh, listed in the 1908 uh, phone directory. Um, some other stuff I found is that uh, Owl Drugstore was actually run by another druggist. It's probably one of his other branches. It was run by a druggist called Shainer for a while. Shainer spelled not like Shainer the Road, but S-C-H-A-N-E-R. John Westendorf, another early uh, pharmacist. There's two Westendorfs. This is the earlier Westendorf. They were both in business at the same time. I'm not sure whether they were brothers or, or father-son kind of thing, but they had their own stores. This guy had five Metropolitan Block Mount Clemens. Every pharmacist gave away giveaways like this. A lot of times their name will just be stamped there, but it's advertising whatever they got for sale in their store. It may not be something they make. This product here is made in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it does have two advertising in the name called Crudo Form. Um, <laughs> here, take some of this Crudo Form. <laughs> but for rheumatic uh, liniment for 25 cents. Maybe it was Crudo Form. Crudiform? Yeah, it's crudiform. <coughs> I like the crudiform. <laughs> but this is uh, John H. West Westendorf, and it's the Weather Flag drug Druggist. So I'm not sure where they had a big flag out there. A lot of them had catchy names, you know, Sign of the Golden Mortar or the Gord Golden Pestle, you know, or something. Like some kind of catchy thing that they always tried to, tried to do. But he had a very interesting one, the, uh, the Weather Flag Druggist. Not sure what it was. I don't have a picture, but there's a lot of pictures of some of the early drugstores. And I tried to hunt some of them now because I know I've seen them, but I couldn't find them in time to get them incorporated in here. I did find one of the central drugstores in uh, Mount Clemens, but I didn't have a bottle for that one. But you get the Dolby Drug Company, which is a big drugstore. These are found, found quite frequently, all different sizes. Uh, Dolby actually worked for Weston Door, and in uh, 1901 he forms his own. Uh, own grocery store on Levin North Gratiot. And uh, unfortunately the bottles are not all that interesting. He just decided I'm just going to put my name on it in the city, but I guess that's better than buying the ones that are unembossed, which then have no provenance or interest then, you know, once they're in the ground and buried and the label dissolves. Now you'll find some of these bottles every now and then that have come out of an attic. I've got some early ones from the 1860s and 1870s, the paper labeled ones, where it actually has the, the druggist on it from Detroit. I've got some early ones from uh, about 1850, I don't know where it's from now. I think it's Alma, Michigan, which is very unusual. <coughs> the label looks like it's actually done with pen and ink. Scrolls and like the early stuff is very unusual. <coughs> uh, there's some other druggists I wanted to mention there. I jumped one there. There's the Central Drug Store. There's also uh, Milford Daner, John Meyer. Uh, there was a Moxon Liniment Company. There's also an interesting bottle. I've seen a few of those out there. With George Shotwell, and there's the other Western War. Even the mineral waters, which of course, uh, Mount Clemens is known for mineral baths, and they're also known for their mineral waters. 
But the mineral water craze started a little earlier than that. It started in Detroit. It wasn't very long lived, right? about 1856. It's pretty much done in Detroit. Now, the mineral water craze goes all over the place in Lansing and Eaton Rabbit, Eaton Rabbits, Alpena, Michigan. All of them have these wonderful, big, magnetic uh, mineral spring water bottles like this, small pints and quarts with cities on them. Detroit didn't do that, fortunately. Uh, we'll see here that uh, uh, some were done on, in Mount Clemens. Though. But these are some early uh, Detroit ones. This is Calon and Crown from about 1851, 1852, uh, Wright and Webster. And uh, this is a very short time period for these two people. They're 1851, 1852 time period there now, because by about 1853, you don't find any listing of them at all. Keller's Mineral Water is one of the early ones. He starts advertising mineral water. He, he comes to Detroit 1836 as a druggist grocer, but he'll sell anything that's, that the market will you know, take right now. So about 1848, he's advertising that he's selling crocs, sarsaparilla beer, stuff from the East Coast that he's having brought in. But he also starts selling his own Teller's mineral water at that time period. 1856 is when he goes out of business, and that's pretty much the end of it. These come in a range of different uh, shapes. The 10 pin here, which is extremely a desirable bottle. There's seven different variations of Teller's mineral water, so he was in business from 1848 to 1856, selling mineral water. Uh, mineral waters in um, Mount Clements, I guess the literature shows that the first uh, well was drilled in 1865, and I guess they were looking for oil, I understand, and they found water. Hey, we could peddle it as a mineral water because it had a nice, nasty smell. <laughs> and the first bathhouse appears in 1873. And I'm just going to cover some of the mineral springs here. This is the Mount Clemens Mineral Spring. This is a bottle from about the 1880s time period. This is Mount Clemens Mineral Springs Company. It's embossed on the bottom. It's got a blob added top, so it's done by period where they're going to hold it in the sabot and put the top on and form it. It does look uneven, so chances are it was uh, hand formed with some type of tool. I do have a mineral water from Detroit to tell mineral water, I've got to point out. There's also a very desirable thing from this Mount Clemens Mineral Springs. It doesn't show up as much as I like it in here. I try every way to light this bottle. I don't have this in my collection. There's two or three out there, and I went to one of the guys in South Line that has one. It says Mount Clemens Mineral Spring Company Limited, and it's got a nice fancy shield here. And inside the shield, the guy's got to pay for the embossing. Now, he just wrote everything on the bottle there, so what am I going to put in the shield? Mount Clemens Mineral Spring Company Limited. Why would you pay twice for the same embossing? I never quite understood that when I look at that bottle. It's unusual, but it's a very pretty and very attractive bottle. I couldn't quite get it lit here right to, uh, to get it uh, proper for the presentation. But you guys can see it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Another one of those early springs is Panacea. You see a lot of these early postcards with their little pavilion. You see their ads. You know, this one here, I think it's from uh, 1915 Cutter's Guide. You probably have seen a lot of the early Mount Clemens Cutter Guide where they start advertising all the mineral baths and um, uh, uh, mineral waters that are available. This is an ad taken from 1915 or 1914. I'm not sure which one I have at home. This is uh, one of their bottles here. One of their big bottles. Five Five gallon. Mount well, Clemens Panacea spring water. So people have this delivered it to their house or to their workplace. I guess this is when you really want to drink a lot of it. Uh, that would have been some auto smelling water. Where they had to return so many people for a little, a little cup to drink it. How did they pour it? Well, this would have been out of a dispenser where they would have just like, uh, like just telling me I got to move fast. <laughs> um, this would have been just like out of regular out of your water coolers that you see at work nowadays. Same kind of thing, uh, not uh, plastic house or anything, but you know, something like that time period. Uh, that came out of Alpena, actually. I went an auction in Alpena, and I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, look at that big bottle. It's getting ready to leave. I'm like, well, that'll probably be another Abso Pure from Detroit. But I better go take a look at it. Oh, oh, Mount Clemens, all the way up here in Alpena. I'll just stick around for this auction. I added it to the collection. Will you pay for it? Surprisingly, I only paid 32 bucks for it. I was quite happy with that because I thought, oh my gosh, I saw two other guys really handling it and looking at it. And I'm thinking, 
there's just not a lot of pop from uh, Mount Clemens. It's kind of unusual. I don't know if they got it from somewhere else. But there's other bottling works. You got Mount Clemens bottling works. This is their big one, so that's what I'm going to pop. You got Viewers bottling works. This possibly could be a pop, but as you know, Viewers is a big brewer out of Detroit, out of uh, Mount Clemens. And for a little while there, if you noticed earlier, I was talking about Wagner from Detroit. Here's Wagner and Company, Mount Clemens, Michigan. No one knows much about this, but it's obviously going to be the 1873, 1874 time period. And Wagner only did pop, so obviously he had a little partnership in Mount Clemens there where he did pop. These are also ones I don't have on the presentation there. This is a, a seltzer water company out of Mount Clemens. Much later on. Of course, he's going to turn out really well. That's the A Wagner, and that's the other one. August Mueller, early brewer in Detroit. He has the Clinton River Brewery. Uh, highly desirable early bottle. He comes to Detroit, uh, Mount Clemens, comes from Germany in 1867. He starts his brewery in Mount Clemens, 1873, with the Clinton River Brewery. Now everyone of most German origin is brewing lager beer. And lager beer just doesn't stay very well, so they don't bottle it. It stays in kegs until pasteurization comes around. You'll find some earlier beer bottles from Detroit where they were doing ales and more robust beers that are gonna last a little longer, that are more hoppy. But lager doesn't stay very long, so they never move it down to the bottle level until pasteurization comes around in 1874. So he's here in 1873, and this is an early, very desirable uh, beer bottle from Mount Clemens. Uh, it's August Viewer, Clinton River Brewery. It's rumored that it comes in amber also. It's a very tough bottle to get. I don't own one, and I went to visit someone else's collection to get this picture. It was a real nice specimen. But there's a whole range of early viewer stuff. This is a, a viewer brewery in Mount Clemens, Michigan, which is this run. Get this the out of the way. It's starting right here. Right through the time period, you got the early blob top, and they progressed to the Baltimore loop closure, right into the crown tops. And then as, you know, towards the end, they're going to do that. The last ones with more of a space focused on for having the label on the bottle. Uh, they last right up to 1919 when Prohibition kicks in, and that's pretty much the end of them. These two bottles you see quite frequently out there. There's all kinds of advertisement for the viewers. There's trays and glasses, bottle openers with wood handles. There's a whole lot of different stuff out there that I've seen. I don't have it in my collection, but I've seen it out there. Another one of the big early brewers is uh, Mount Clemens Brewing Company. So a viewer pretty much ran the whole market on it. There was a brewer in Mount Clemens prior to him called uh, Miller, uh, which kind of fades away. Uh, I've never seen any bottles for him, but I think he's pretty much out of business by the time when bottles are around. But you have the Mount Clemens Brewing Company. You get a whole range of early ones. Like they said, this starts uh, uh, in 1890, so you aren't going to get the early blob tops. You're going to jump right into the Baltimore loop closure time period. Got a whole different range of ones. Got a big port one here that I picked up at the Armada Flea Market. Uh, this one I actually found in Stony Creek Metro Park. This one I uh, got from a guy that was selling a collection. This one came out of the river here. This whole side of the bottle's been laying down in the river, and it's all warm. You can see when the water's been passing over all the sand and gravel. So you pick up a whole lot of wear on one side of the bottle. It says TTC 1093, so they bought from the Terry Tower, Tower Collection in October of 1993. Who found it? I didn't find that one. Okay. So, we just want to clarify that. Yeah, I found that. I didn't find that one. Back. And I even did find it. Wines and liquors, there's not a whole lot from Mount Clemens. I wish there, there was as far as the big stoneware jugs and all the advertising. I haven't seen anything. There is a this one bottle, and no one seems to know much about the com company. It's uh, Mount Clemens Wine Company, Mount Clemens, Michigan. Nice porcelain stopper. Uh, there's uh, three of them that are known. I had two of them at one time. So obviously the company didn't run on three bottles because you wouldn't be making a whole lot of them. So there's probably a whole lot of them out there somewhere. One of them I know that's out there has got a hole in the bottom that somebody repaired. It looks like they shot it with a BB gun and they repaired it with a little bit of epoxy resin. The other this one and the other one I actually found in an antique shop in Royal Oak. And uh, I parted with the other one early before I knew that a whole lot of people loved Mount Clemens bottles and I probably should have got it to some other people that were more desirable 
collectors as far as Mount Clemens item, but it, it went its way because it was a duplicate. So. And also we got an early uh, Frederick Mill here, liquor bottle. Frederick Mill starts in Detroit in uh, 1870s. Right before Prohibition, there's all kinds of liquor houses in Detroit, all over the place selling. This is actually uh, F.S. Karbatsky liquor. Uh, this is on. Uh, One is Shane and Hancock, and the other one is uh, something in Adele. So they had two, two, uh, two locations where he was doing it. There's all kinds of bottles out there uh, from the Detroit area. Unfortunately, not many from Mount Clemens. And that's a close up, which didn't quite turn out. I want to see the bottle a little closer. Milk bottles. Milk bottles are not really my forte. There's a whole world of people that just really enjoy milk bottles. And the closures that go with them, the cardboard box, and all the stuff that go with it. When I see items and I pick them up, I usually don't go out of my way to get them, but I have a few. I don't have any from Mount Clemens. One of the big Mount Clemens uh, milk uh, companies is the Miller, but most of the time those are the later square bottles. I got one here from Romeo, Michigan, Knott's. I also got one here from, uh, uh, this is uh, St. Clair Heights Creamery at 4718 Kerwin Avenue. Both Kerwin Avenue and St. Clair Heights don't exist anymore. They were all absorbed in Detroit, and Kerwin is now French, French Road, I think. So, things change. We also got a Hamtramck from here. We got a Ruff's Dairy from St. Clair. We got a Bogert's Dairy from Marine City. Uh, we got one from, yeah, Roseville Creamery, Roseville, Michigan. I actually had to get that because I knew it was out there. Actually, I got two of them. And I found one after I bought this one, I paid for it. I found a nice one that was real cheap, and I'm like, I just haven't sold the other one yet. And this one's also another uh, St. Clair dairy. I think this is. Yeah, yeah. Take my other dairy items. I do have a nice wood plaque here. It came off an end of a crate here from uh, actually Mount Clemens. It's from the Chesterfield Creamery, their butter product. I assume they had a dairy line also of milks, that is. Of course, milk is dairy. I'm sorry, butter is dairy. Where bottles are found, of course, I just wanted to, there anywhere place people want to get rid of them, out of sight, out of mind, get rid of your trash, they'll put them on surface dumps, they'll bury them in holes, they'll put them in outhouses. Water is a wonderful receptacle for getting rid of stuff. You get rid of the rivers and the lakes and in the wetlands. And you fill in any low area with uh, trash, bottles will be there. Any place they're digging, you'll find it. Of course, I always love this postcard from uh, Mount Clemens here. It's a scene from the, uh, I forget that which bridge this is. It's on the back of the other postcard. For some reason, someone typed 1909 here. It doesn't make any sense because the postcard on the other side was posted in 1905, so I don't understand how it could be. Someone could type that in. But actually, there's an earlier version of this postcard, which I own, that indicates that this picture from this bridge was taken in 1895. So you can imagine all the stuff that ended in Clinton River here and every little lowland around the area. Of course, I don't know if I'd be diving in here. Although I'd love to uh, go in there with my kayak and do some raking in the low areas to check it out, because I definitely would like to get to where the Spruill Water Company was. It's right there underneath the sheriff's building there over there in the parking lot is where Spruill Water was. And I'm talking to the guy that runs the race water facility, also runs the, um, you know, the water utilities. He said when they were digging there, they just ran through a whole vein of bottles, all different colors, and I'm like, Pick any up. Well, some of the guys did. I'm thinking, oh, well, them all. But you know, you always hear that story all the time. I mean, when they were doing the Renaissance Center, when they were digging uh, the footings, they ran into a massive trove of Teller's Mineral Waters. And the guy was there when they did it. He ran in real quick, grabbed a few, and then they just kept excavating and they just hauled all that stuff up and dumped. So there would have been, you know, thousands of these you know, 1850s Teller's Mineral Waters that could have been saved, but construction's got to get done. Just <laughs> and mind tell them what they're worth today? 50 cents. No, actually, Teller's Mineral Waters are uh, quite desirable. A lot of early bottles are quite desirable from Detroit. Teller's Mineral Waters range anywhere from condi on condition, you know, 400 to 800 dollars. So this is a nice specimen here. Some of the early Mount Clemens bottles. I mean, seltzer water from Mount Clemens. You know, these are two or three dollars. Uh, it's brutal water and perfect. Amber like this, you know, that's a thousand dollars. It all it all ranges in different sizes. And there's 
You can't imagine that now this brutal one, the blue one, you see quite a few of them. But the amber one, this is going to be at the end of the run. They obviously didn't just work off. I know there's three of those known, so they obviously didn't work moving their water on three bottles. Otherwise, it wouldn't work too well as far as the business. And that's about it. Any questions? Yes, sir. Do you have uh, anything from uh, Marshall Chapin's Drugstore in Detroit? Anything? I don't have items. I've got history on, on Chapin. Because uh, uh, Chapin is going to be an early uh, druggist from Detroit. That's what I got here real quick, actually. 1823 and 24. I just want to see real quick. I got it right here, so why not? I know you want to get me out of here. Yeah, so actually Chapin is going to be... Uh, um, it would be Marshall. Okay, so this is going to be the historical, historical time period. I know what you're talking about, Chapin, Marshall and Chapin. Which doctor? Yeah. Dr. Marshall Marshall Chapin. is an early doctor. I mean, this is what I got under the second right here. There he is. There John Owen. So he's an early partner in the John Owen. He's, he's the founder. He's going to pass the business on to not this John Owen, but the big John Owen of the big uh, grocery oh. drugstore and druggist. And he sells everything. When you go in the early newspaper, he's, you can buy anything and everything from him. He sells it all. So, uh, is, there, is there a Marshall Chapin bottle? Not that I've ever seen. Okay. In that time period, uh, you know, you look at 1790s, 1809. Any other questions? I can as I'm scrolling here. The mayor of Detroit, 1831. Yes. I, I started to find out the history in here. An ambassador to France. Okay. I got a couple of fish bottles. Are they worth anything? Um, yes and no. Um, I got a clear one that sets on its tail, mouth yeah. straight up, and I got one that lays on its fins. Up kind of a violet or purple. Is it like a free blow one where it looks like it's all been done by hand? Or I know something that came out of France like that. I don't know was. what the difference is if they're blown by hand. There was a, actually a, a bottle that I had pictured here that was a fish one. It was a profile of fish and it says, around the eye, it says fish bitters. Okay. They're bizarre. <coughs> um, I don't know. The clear one is setting on his tail fins okay. straight up. His mouth is straight up for the bottle neck. And uh, the other one is laying on its spin so it keeps the cork wet. I was thinking maybe it was a wine bottle. Actually, I, I have one of those. It's, uh, it's from the 1940s, and it's the one I'm thinking of. And it came from France, and it is a wine that was distributed out of a Detroit uh, liquor house. My grandfather had one, and it was in a bar because I got it. Mine is yellow, though. No, this um, one's a violet or purple. There are a lot of fish bottles, and you have to be wary, because a lot of the early bottles, you'll look at them, and you turn them over on the bottom, and they'll say Wheaton, New Jersey. Wheaton Glassworks remade bottle, a lot of the early bottles. Sometimes even the original Yeah, bottles. they had a little pint bottle, or a little, uh, with a glass lid that clamped on. Oh, this one, right? Go ahead. Yes. Remember I told you we found bottles of Romeo? But I could never get them clean. How do you get yours so clean? Some of these have never been dirty. Uh, but ones that are like this, where they call the glass becoming sick, so actually you've got parts of the components of the glass leaching out, you can scrub it and get some of this loose stuff off. This one's never been cleaned other than probably rinsed in water. It's still got part of the contents dried in there as it came out of a privy. I hope it's contents of the bottle, but the contents of the privy. <coughs> so. He uses different chemicals and lead shot. Yeah, lead shot you can use to clean it just, just to get some of the loose stuff out. Now, we have around. a good polished, beautiful, clean, basically you need to take the sick glass off. And that's a little bit more of an involved process. You're just taking a very micro fine layer off using, it's usually done in a, a tumbler and it's mixed with copper shot and aluminum and you just basically are sanding off a very fine surface in the bottom and it'll look just pretty. You know, it'll look like this. Now this one came, you can see the water line where this one was standing on a shelf, so this one was never in the ground. This one's been buried and if you wanted to make it perfect. You could tumble it yourself, or you can have a guy professionally tumble it for, they charge anywhere from $10 to $15 per bottle. This is a long, slow tumbling. 
and they got to turn it over and they got to take it out and check it every now and then. So hopefully it doesn't break. <laughs> so, and yes, and well, it's the same type of question. I have bottles here and I have no idea of their age and uh, they've still got bubbles in them and I've never cleaned them because I'm afraid to. Sometimes I just leave them the way they are because I'm afraid to, to clean them. I mean, it's part of the character of the bottle. There is the whole, both sides of the, the philosophy, you know, to clean or not to clean. Are you actually changing the bottle by cleaning it? You know, That's are you I'm altering it, yeah. you know, kind of thing. Because if you're taking a micro layer off the bottle, I mean, this bottle obviously was found in an ash pit or diving. It's definitely got a lot of uh, opalescence to it. So, it's, you know, you could clean it and make it look nice like this. Yeah, this one here is bed tumble. You can see actually little scratch layers on it. So this one's probably found diving. You can see little scratch layers, but you can't quite get it all out. Especially if it's been hi highly abraded, you aren't going to get it out. It's like uh, collectors coins. You say never clean. Oh, them. yeah, with coins, it's definitely they're never to clean. The value goes down. down. This this Wait, bottle here was absolutely iridescent like this. It didn't even look blue. And I know the guy that had it. He had it clean. There was no scratches on it. So it actually, you can't even tell that it's been cleaned. It looks like an original bottle. And the fact that I know that he had it clean. So Did you ever obtain a Hadacol bottle? Hadacol? I've, I've heard that name before somewhere. It's one of those liquor medicine things from the 50s or 60s or somewhere back in then. And they were selling it for five, ten years. And then they had to put a stop to it, I guess, because there was alcohol. Oh, well, well, most, most of your medicines, that was the primary ingredient. Yeah. yeah. All kinds of strange little herbs and medicines and a whole lot of alcohol. Yeah. It, it was out in 1950. 1950? Because uh, when I was going to college, we used to put it in squirt guns and squirt yeah. each other. <laughs> <laughs> Water didn't work so well? It, it smelled, didn't it? Oh, it smelled. Oh, okay. Yeah. But yes, it did have uh, alcohol kind of. Okay. They would put lighter in front of it. <laughs> they were flaming the shot. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any kind of demand for uh, prohibition bottles? If they're marked, yes. I mean, you've got the labels on them. Uh, I know people that are diving and they found, uh, you know, whiskey bottles with prohibition still corked on it. And I know some that have taken the gamble of sampling it because, you know, people made a lot of bad stuff. Mm -hmm with all different types of alcohols. You know, people bought industrial grade alcohol, which was uh, denatured with strange different components, formaldehyde and all different kinds of things to make it poisonous. So people wouldn't use it, but people would still mix it up and sell it as whiskey or whatever and blend it and then people would get sick or die. So a lot of people that, well, oh, and I'll eat olives out there, but I won't drink whiskey necessarily. Because <laughs> I don't know what's in there. That they, you know, they pass, you know, passing off as alcohol. <laughs> Is the texture of those bottles all smooth? Um, as opposed to? As uh, opposed to, like someone had a brush and brushed it. Um, well, you can get acid etched. I mean, these, these don't feel smooth. They actually have this feel. That's just the age, you know, that's done that to them. But you can, you can acid etch a bottle. You know, they, they've done bottles, because, you know, uh, even bottles nowadays don't have them that are acid etched. For effect, you know, uh, this is a big bottle cover. Now, Grey Goose, I think, has got the bottle half acid etched. You know, you can it feels, you know, like it's been sandblasted. It's frosted. Are you familiar with the brown snuff bottles? Are they worth Browns? Brown? No, that's not the name. The color brown. Oh yeah, they're they're snuff bottles. They pretty much look like this usually, but they're about this tall. Yeah. They may have a top like this and various different lips. Right. They made that style of bottle for a long time because you can find them everything from Tonto right up into the 1940s. Oh, okay. um, the early ones, you know, people are interested in getting, you know, early examples. Uh, but the, the later stuff, unless it's got the paper labels on it, you know, mm -hmm. people kind of hem and haw, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. Okay. What does it say at the bottom? Yes, sir. The um, metal top on that bottle right there, the clear one there, Yes. What do you call that? There's two different versions of this. Uh, the one, one we have has a porcelain top. If it has a porcelain top, I can tell you right now, most likely if you flip it open, you'll probably see on the inside a very tiny little lettering. Of course, the rubber on this one is not going to get open, but 
actually, it'll probably say Hutter on it, because Hutter was the guy that patented the porcelain stopper, some other people afterwards, and they'll say Hutter stopper. But actually, that's Hutter? Hutter, yeah. H U T T E R. T T E R. E R. Now, the thing is, that's like a stenciled on light baked material, which if the bottle has been exposed to any environment, they actually decompose. Because you actually find I don't remember saying anything. We have two of the ones from uh, uh, Eagle. Now these bottles here, they would they would interchange. They could use a hunter stopper. They could use a uh, Hutchinson. The Hutchinson also made this too, but also uh, you know, they kind of made this. When too. did beer start to go into those bottles? Prohibition. 1874. I'm mean, sorry, 1874. As soon as you could. Uh, uh, pasteurized beer. That's when they started and bottling. If the beer was made before 1874, it was usually a lager. It was, uh, it was usually in barrels. Uh, lager was the was the. There was a whole wide range of beers. A lot of early beers you see 1860s. They were making a whole lot of unusual wheat beers and Weiss beers and unusual things. The lager became popular right away. A lot of German immigrants, a lot of early German viewers, 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 breweries. And that's what they made, and that was popular, and that's what's pretty much in the whole United States right now is all lager beer, Budweiser, all that's all lager. <coughs> uh, but you know, interchangeably, they could use about any kind of stopper on these, because you'll find these with a Buckland stopper on it. You'll find them, you know, with, with uh, this stopper. You'll actually find crown tops that people have taken and they've wired on bale closures on, all kinds of different things, because a lot of people made homebrew. I didn't touch on this one, Clemens Brewery. In business just before prohibition two years John G Freeman Sorry, I almost forgot about him <laughs> he's not in uh, in the book either I don't know if you guys are familiar with Peter Blum uh, from the Stroh Museum he's passed away but he got this book out finally before he passed away because he had such a wealth of information I'm glad he got it out uh, it's called Brood in Detroit he does touch on the Mount Clemens beers in here he talks about viewers and he talks about Mount Clemens but he doesn't mention Freeman we have to go to other sources about the freedom theory. But he just talked about the great Baraboo in here, though. Right there. <laughs> <laughs> the great Baraboo company. But the upcoming of, you know, microbrews and brew clubs and all that kind of stuff. That's not that there. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Oh, yes, sirs. <laughs> uh, you were talking about uh, crying. You mentioned crying about bottles. Have you ever cried over breaking a bottle or dropping it? It seems to me, what you have, it, that would be enough. What's the greatest loss you ever had? I don't want to experience it. No, actually, no, I've never broke a, a real valuable bottle. Uh, I've had bottles break for no reason at all. I mean, one of my Mount Clemens beers here had no uh, crack in it. And after I cleaned it, I was walking by it the next day, I noticed that it uh, just developed a crack. The older glass gets uh, insensitive, and it just you know, won't have issues by itself. One of these two is cracked. There's no way to find it. There it is, it's at the top, yeah. It just developed a crack, a ping. And I've had bottles just break. I've never had anything really heartbreaking break. I broke uh, some beer bottles from Manistee, Michigan. <laughs> uh, nothing really valuable that I broke uh, happily so far. And we have four cats and they have never broken a bottle. And they've never broken a bottle yet. We have four cats running around. I notice how careful you're handling. <laughs> so, uh, no, I haven't broken any, so that's kind of, kind of keep it that way. <laughs> I found some ones that are, you know, sick when I see that they're broken when I find them, you know, and I piece them back together like this. I've got a bottle similar that only it's like half the size or about three quarters the size and it's got Kickapoo Joy Juice on it. Okay, yeah, there was a whole How big, long ago was that? There's a lot of companies there that I'm not familiar with, but Indian, Indian uh, lore and medicines and, and all kinds of stuff was extremely popular. And there are some from, actually from the Detroit area, there's the Umatilla Indian cure the Umatilla and uh, blood cure the Umatilla Indian hoga and all kinds of strange stuff. You know. Well, it had this. liquid in it when I bought it, but I think it evaporated oh, yeah. since. There's probably some interesting alcohol content in there. You know, 
know, they got the strange recipe from the strange chief that I met in the field, and now it'll cure anything. And there's a whole lot of that. And had, most, most of the labels there, but I think it's yeah. tore a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff. Okay. You might, you might feel like collect a, a lot of the railroad lanterns, and of course the early railroad lanterns are uh, like colored globes, especially if they're. Uh, embossed or engraved, and one of our big problems in the last 20 years have been the reproductions that have been hitting the market, and there have been even faking, uh, you know, uh, a yeah. lot of the well-known names and even fooling the experts. Has that happened at all in some of these, these monogram bottles, or have you been able to uh, well, pull it off? this or? era time period, uh, there are some of the big, you know, there are bidders bottles that sell $60,000, <coughs> $80,000 a bottle. So, there are some high end stuff, you better definitely know what you're looking at there. It's hard to fake those. There is a whole lot of uh, faking of, if you ever see the Globe Tobacco Jar Works, Eagle ones with the lid, and it looks like a little barrel. Yeah. It's got the tin lid on it and everything. There's a whole lot of those that have been coming out of China that are fake. Um, there's a, not necessarily fakes, but done in the original tradition. You can find some early uh, squat or onions that are. Uh, Redone. They'll be solid pontals <coughs> made in Spain in the 60s and 70s. And you know, you can go to anyone that's skilled in, in Williamston can do a nice, nice bottle like this. Mm -hmm. Of course, they'll probably etch it that it was made there. You know, sure. keep, it, keep it honest. And, and they're still making some of that stuff for living history folks. Okay. Yeah, the living history stuff you can look at and you're like, think. I mean, if you know it, you can see that it's it's not right. I've, I've been to places where people have had onions that are absolutely mint perfect. You know, this is 1700, so there's going to be a scratch. There's definitely going to be some abrasion on the bottom where it's been set and moved around. And personal I have one that's absolutely flawless. We'll have all these, they're usually really bubbled, but very evenly bubbled through the whole thing. This one's like erratically bubbled. And you're like, you know, this is a reproduction. Oh, no, it's not. It is. Oh, it's not. Okay, well, whatever. And they'll be charging, you know, the, the price of it like it's an authentic, you know, 17 Okay, I'm just telling you, I'm going to keep you honest. Uh, yes, sir. How about cases? Are those, uh, I have a lot of scrolls cases. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I, I like uh, cases too. The thing is, storage uh, of them. Cardboard I got cases. Which one? Oh, cardboard ones. The cardboard ones, yes, I've got those too. Um, I just saw some nice ones at the Utica Antique Market. The guy had some Stroh's ones, and he had very reasonable price on them. He had seven dollars and eight dollars, which was very reasonable. They're good condition for for cardboard cases. Uh, real nice condition. You know, I figured they're usually about twenty bucks in really good condition with all the dividers in there. It's really nice. So, some crates can be extremely expensive for uh, short-lived or highly desirable collectors. This Atlas beverage is probably most of us remember this from the uh, Detroit area. I remember drinking it when I was a kid. We could buy it right up until like 82 or 83. Uh, and they just blew all these out. They had a whole warehouse full of these. So I got a bunch of these uh, from a guy that I was actually running a record store. He was using me to store records. He had bought a whole ton of them. And he was selling them for $4 a crate. You know, because when he didn't carry <laughs> So I use it for storage. Yes, sir. Oh. Okay. Well, it's made by the Ball Glass Works, as you can see, Ball is on there. It's famous for canning jars. This one is made in USA. It's got the patent number for the patent for the bottle. It's got the federal law prohibits the reuse and sale of this bottle. This is a nice, definitely put a time period on it. This came in right after Prohibition, and they were allowed to take it off the bottle of the law card of the movement in 65. So this is 1934 to 1965. Um, the D125, 126, refers to the actual permit uh, that they had to get from the federal government to sell this lecture. So actually, if you look down to the database, you can find out what company this was for the bottle. Four fifths of a quart. Probably one of these two numbers here are probably actually the year. Yeah, since this is going to be made from uh, you know 1934 to 1965, this second digit, two digits here, 48 is probably the year it's made, 1948. Mm -hmm. It's usually the number that you can look at and that you can see where they pinged it out and they kept changing it, advancing it. 
So my guess is this is probably 1948. It's obviously not 1976. So it's probably any two years of ever and usually on the year. Actually, I could, oh, I didn't bring those books with me. Yeah, I forgot some. I had, uh, there's a big publication on uh, glass makers and their marks and you can figure out date systems and all that. Well, I already got two big binders. Because the original publication from 71 and all the literature that keeps coming out, I photographed, photocopied the whole book, I keep adding. So it's also two big, three ring binders, everything on every glass maker. Thank you. Yes. Hi, I saw a uh, very unusual Coca-Cola bottle once, and I wonder if you could shed some light on it. I was in Wales, and in this woman's house, they found this in an old coal mine. It was a Coke bottle, and it had a glass channel down the side with a glass ball. So if the Coke bottle ever fell over, the ball would seal it so the contents okay. didn't fall out. Do you know the time no, frame with it? It's not necessarily Coke. It said Coke. It was Did Coke? it say Coke on it? Yeah. It's it unusual. Um, that's a whole style of bottle that was big in, the, in England. Mm -hmm. It was an English inventor. It's, his name was Cod, C-O-D-D. -D, so they're called Cods. Okay. It's a Cod closure. I don't have any here. They call it marble bottles. Yeah. They were big in uh, Bermuda, South Africa, New Zealand, What's Australia. What's the time frame of what did you for? Well, I think he patented that bottle in the 1860s, but they oh. were in use right up until Crown Tops came around in 1905. Good. So uh, there's quite a few out there. What would something like that be worth? Oh, geez. Well, uh, before Hudson's went out of business, they actually brought a whole a bunch of those early cods and they were selling them for how much? It, 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 and I, I understand how a, a modern company was selling whole bottles. They're making sense to me. Remember that? No, I was just. Lisa was looking for those. Those are reproductions. No, no, they were originals. They were, but they, but they were from uh, from the British Empire. You know, time period. Bucks. Yeah, 15, 20 bucks. Now there are some rare variants. There's some expensive ones, I and mean, there's so many out there. Because there's ones that have colored marbles on the inside, as opposed to just an aqua glass marble. And well, this it made me nervous. Who would let anybody wanted to handle this thing, passing around? Thing. Oh my gosh, you know. There's some the early Coke bottles that come from uh, you know don't be Hutchinson sodas like. <laughs> to receive the newsletter, the next copy, there's a sign-up list over there. Yeah, I belong to the, I'm the president of Detroit Bottle Club and also the newsletter editor. So if you have a uh, email address, I can zip you off a copy electronic. Very easily comes in an Adobe file. Okay.